The Year of Faith, celebrating 50 years of Vatican II, is a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. It seeks to share important information on the documents of the Second Vatican Council and how they shaped and changed the life of the church. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jeffrey Mickler. Hello and welcome to Year of Faith, celebrating 50 years of Vatican II. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. Today we're very happy to welcome to our show Bishop John Michael Botin. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show today, Bishop. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. And we're going to be discussing the decree on the Catholic Churches of the Eastern Rite. And before we get into our discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Father Mickler to give us an overview briefly of the document. The document is very rich and poignant. It really changed the way the church viewed herself. Most Catholics would think of the Eastern churches as Eastern Rite churches, but this was very limiting and also inaccurate. They are really the sister churches within the one true church. And this attitude is so important because they have their own authority, their own structure, as well as their own history and rites and rituals. The attempts before the Vatican Council to Latinize these ancient churches was really harmful and it changed with the publication of this very important document. What would you see as the main thrust of this document of the Council? Well, if you don't mind, I, yes. I, I put a bookmark right in here because I think one of the, uh, one of the principal uh, phrases in here is in paragraph 5. Uh, that uh, and the, the line that I wanted to read was, for this reason, the Second Vatican Council solemnly declares that the churches of the East, as much of those as those of the West, fully enjoy the right and are in duty bound to rule themselves. Mm -hmm. So the very notion of some kind of any kind of autonomy mm -hmm. within the Catholic Communion was sort of brought in mm -hmm. in a very important way for the, and, and for the first time in the modern world, that we have in the Catholic Church a communion of churches mm -hmm. and not uh, a segmented uh, mega church with some small departments uh, mm -hmm. where uh, individuals of various exotic backgrounds celebrate quaint rites and colorful folk customs and, mm -hmm. and boy, aren't we happy to be Catholics because we do all of this stuff. But the Catholic Church, the church, Mm -hmm. is of its nature a communion. Mm -hmm. And this is a document, as short as it is, that recognizes it in a, um, a very practical way for the Catholic Church itself. Perhaps you could explain a little bit to us like what the structure of, say, a patriarch is, an eparch, an, an archbishop within these various rites, and how they're structured. The uh, churches, the uh, 21 Eastern churches in communion with the Catholic Church, uh, like Orthodox churches, of which many are cognates, are all called uh, sui juris or autonomous churches, mm -hmm. churches with their own governance. The one document that was promulgated to, uh, uh, to uh, um, implement, sorry, mm -hmm. implement the, this, this document, or autonomous ecclesiarm, was the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, and that was promulgated in 1990. And that is the one thing that we have in common. There's a common, very simple code of canons that are applicable to all Catholic Eastern churches. Beyond that, and contained within the code itself, is the mandate to establish law for ourselves. And that's mostly in uh, the lands of origin, the original territories of these Eastern churches. But also it has a lot to do with how th these churches govern their daughter churches in the West, in the United mm -hmm. States and Canada in we, we used to, um, uh, at least in the document, used to refer to uh, Eastern rites, mm -hmm. but now we, we talk about the, the sister churches, and so there's that whole, that whole sense of, of a unity that's there uh, in our language even. Uh, but l let's uh, take a, a step back, and the document itself, um, obviously the title is Oriental Churches. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people might get confused with what exactly do we talk about when we say an Oriental Rite or Oriental Church. What do we mean by that, that very phrase? 
what we mean are uh, churches, historic churches, many of them of apostolic origin. Go back to the earliest days of Christianity or to the initial evangelization of their own people, such as the Slavs about a thousand years ago. Uh, but those churches, uh, most of them at one point or another through the way history works, um, became separated from the Catholic Church. And in the case of, of, of the Eastern Catholic Churches, uh, at some point in their history, re-entered communion with the Catholic Church without abandoning any of their traditional discipline or any of their rites, R-I-G-H-T-S, mm -hmm. as well as R-I-T-E-S. Mm -hmm. The Church is a church, and the Catholic Church, the Universal Church, is a communion of particular churches. And each of the Eastern Catholic Churches is a particular church. You had asked before about mm -hmm. patriarchs and archbishops. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's always a presiding bishop of one kind or another, a prelate, who is the head of an autonomous church. And that's reflected as well in the uh, structure of, of Orthodox churches, for instance. Mm -hmm. There is a presiding bishop of one kind or another. Patriarch is the most ancient uh, and uh, the most uh, uh, senior title mm -hmm. for the head of an autonomous church. Uh, but there are also churches that are, uh, have a major archbishop as head, uh, including now the, the Romanian Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the also an interesting situation where you've got an autonomous church that exists only in the United States. Mm -hmm. and that's the Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, their metropolitan archbishop is in Pittsburgh, and they are autonomous. They have their own particular law, uh, but they cover Ruthenians or Carpetho Rusins. Uh, who folks who came from parts of Ukraine and uh, the former uh, Czechoslovakia uh, at a time when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were a very numerous group here, numerous enough to establish their own independence here. Mm -hmm. Independence, of course, in the Catholic Church is a relative term. Mm -hmm. Everybody is subject to the Holy See. Mm -hmm. And uh, people always ask, are you under the Pope? I mean, that's always the big yes, question. Sir. You, you, you can say that again. You know, of right. course, we're, we're under the Pope. Mm -hmm. But rather, uh, we are in communion with the Pope. Right. He is the head of the College of Bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, we are under, specifically, our own heads, our own patriarchs, major archbishops, metropolitans. Um, and for the first time this year, um, all of the Eastern Catholic churches were called at one time to make our uh, every five-year ad limina visit to Rome. Mm -hmm. So it was a very historic occasion when Eastern Catholic bishops all together went as one group to visit the Holy Father, to visit the, uh, the uh, Apostolic See, and, um, and to carry our concerns, the concerns of the Eastern churches in the West, and the experience of the Eastern churches in the West, mm -hmm. to the Holy See directly as a group. It was quite a a unique time. Yeah, I think the whole thing of the Orient comes from a Western prejudice. They're east of us, so they have to be Eastern. And so in the culture as a whole, you see people saying more Asian. You know, we're not talking about Orientals in culture as a whole as much as we used to. Just to get that notion a little bit out of vogue. But every one of these churches are Catholic in a sense of universal. So that, yes, you could say that Maronite rite is based in Lebanon, started in Lebanon, but it's global. And we have a wonderful national shrine uh, of Our Lady of Lebanon just a few miles from this location. The Ruthenians, they could never have their own nation because everybody was against them, but they had their own culture and so their own faith and it sprang up in the land of the free here able to take root here and develop. Mm -hmm. One of the wonderful things uh, I think about this document but also about our sister churches in the Eastern Rite is, um, is their great spiritual heritage and I think I'd like us to talk about that spiritual heritage and how it's lifted up in light of the document, but also lift it up in its liturgy, in its worship, in its R-I-T-E-S. Mm -hmm. Bishop? That's sort of the beginning and the end and every part in the middle of the story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what attracts people in the West to our churches is specifically our, our liturgical expression mm -hmm. and the kind of spirituality that developed particularly when I'm, and I know best, of course, the Byzantine churches, the churches that got their liturgical origin and, and the, the greatest uh, influence was the Church of Constantinople, what is now Istanbul. <clears throat> um, and in particular, um, liturgical spirituality is very, very important. But the other side of that, the flip side of that is just as important is, uh, for instance, the tradition of the Jesus prayer has a chasm. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which is as unliturgical or anti-liturgical as you can get because it's, it's a form of private prayer that uh, is very, very meditative. And at one time actually kind of ran into a little bit of trouble even in Constantinople mm -hmm. as being somehow uh, too pietistic or quietistic. But it's not the same as quietism as it was right. known and, and, and condemned in the West. But still, the noise, right. all the involvement of all of the senses in our liturgy is kind of balanced out in the private life of the faithful, uh, especially those who practice the prayer of quiet or the prayer of Jesus. Uh, and it all fits together. I think many people are attracted because of the numinous spiritual atmosphere that everything about the liturgical rites conveys. And as uh, the bishop explained, you know, all of the senses are engaged and they make the soul really inflamed with the love for Christ in a very special way. It's interesting because when uh, our sister churches speak of uh, their worship, uh, they speak of it as divine worship. Mm -hmm. So there's that, that sense of the, the mystery, the sense of uh, uh, God's uh, centeredness there. Explain that term, divine worship. Divine, yes, it's expected to be an encounter. Now, it's not... What's interesting is that uh, there's clearly a consciousness, even in, in Byzantine worship, that the church itself or herself need do nothing to encounter Christ. Christ lives in the church. And so even though it's divine worship, because it's the church, in fact, you could almost say it's divine because it's the church and the church is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so indeed, you know, we anticipate this encounter with God, specifically in the Eucharistic liturgy, uh, God who sets our, the table that we all gather around, even though, as, as many of, I'm sure your listeners know, Byzantine Catholic churches have an, a screen or an icon, a wall of icons that separate the holy table, as we call it, from the nave of the church. Despite that, there is a real sense of solidarity that, that, that is experienced and expressed in a different way than the gathering around the altar that people are familiar with in the Latin rite. Um, but it is also, in a sense, divine from the sense of movement that comes from the liturgy itself because uh, from the beginning of the liturgy and the opening rites called the Anarchist up until the very Thanksgiving at the end, uh, you, you have a sense that you one is going as part of a group, going somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's going to be face to face with God. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking uh, at a little more length uh, after we take a break on um, the sacraments and how uh, Eastern churches celebrate those. Uh, so we'd like to focus on the sacramental life of the Eastern churches, but we'll talk a little bit more about the divine worship as well because I think that's very important along with the spiritual heritage. Uh, but we're going to take a quick break. Uh, please stay with us. We'll be right back. And now we'd like to focus on uh, the sacraments uh, in the Eastern Rites. And Bishop, if you could uh, talk about that briefly, please. But if, if I can put in a plug, uh, a lot of the uh, liturgical movement that took place in the mid-20th century prior to the Second Vatican Council was uh, a direct result of an exploration of, exposure to, and then an investigation into the history of Eastern worship in particular. And so. Uh, some of our greatest, the contribution of the Eastern churches to the Universal Church through the Second Vatican Council included such things as um, liturgy in the vernacular, communion under both species, and so forth and so on, things that are, have been always part of our, the restoration of the diaconate, uh, have always been a part 
pretty consistent of our experience. Of course, we have the same sacraments as the rest of the Catholic Church, the same seven sacraments. Among Orthodox, non-Catholic, Orthodox uh, Byzantines, the tendency is to talk of at least seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. uh, because some things like monastic profession, uh, the rite of absolution at a funeral are considered pretty close to sacramental, you mm -hmm. know, at least. But uh, in, in the case of the Eastern Catholic Churches, we clearly recognize the seven sacraments, and, uh, but we celebrate them differently somewhat. Uh, for instance, the, one of the most obvious differences in the way we celebrate the, liturgy, the, the Eucharistic liturgy is uh, we have more of a Johannine, if you will, emphasis in, in the liturgy than a synoptic emphasis. We don't look at the Eucharistic celebration so much as a reenactment of the, uh, as a reenactment of the Last Supper, but as a celebration of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we use leavened bread rather than unleavened hosts as a sign of the fulfillment of the promise that the old Passover, mm -hmm. what we would call the old Passover, uh, made, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. We celebrate typically the sacraments of initiation together, baptism, mm -hmm. confirmation, or what we call chrismation and the Eucharist mm -hmm. in their initial order, which is one is baptized, receives the gift, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit through anointing with the Holy Chrism, and then is immediately admitted to the Eucharistic table. So children from infancy, from their baptism, do receive communion in our churches, although, interestingly, this is a point of, uh, at which, in which uh, the Latinization of our churches really, really took hold. Mm -hmm. So that our church, the Romanian church, for instance, that was suppressed and not allowed to exist for almost 50 years in Romania, when it surfaced again in 1989, came back the way it was in 1948, um. with First Communion and all of its pomp and ceremony. Mm -hmm. And so they're wondering what we're doing in the United States. We who didn't go through that, but experienced rather the renewal of our church through the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. why we're doing what the Orthodox do. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Orientalium Ecclesiarum called us to. Mm -hmm. is to, uh, to, to be the points of, the, the referent points, uh, points of contact with uh, orthodoxy in particular. And so it's part of our, our uh, heritage to, uh, to celebrate the sacraments just as we always have. And the understanding about, uh, for instance, infant communion and infant con confirmation is that um, when one is admitted to the church, one is admitted fully to the church. Or as I like to explain to parents, can you explain to me how bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ? But what do you expect your child to understand? You know, our adult understanding is as, at least as infantile in the mind of God mm -hmm. as a child's understanding is compared to ours. And so we have no trouble. In fact, parents understand that they need to nourish the divine life in their children through the celebration of the sacraments. Could you explain to our viewers exactly how the infant receives his first communion right at that baptismal day, or, and what, what's the procedure for that? Well, as I mentioned before, we've always uh, offered, uh, communion is always under both kinds or both species. Right. And so uh, on a baptism, the, the day of a, of a child's baptism, um, a little bit of, of the precious blood mm -hmm. on a spoon was put on their lips. Mm -hmm. and, and they're fine with that until they can have solid food. Right. Mm -hmm. it does, and I'm a little ignorant in this myself, but um, uh, when then uh, does the infant receive communion again? Is that every time? time? Every time. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Uh, uh, this is another ignorant question on my part, but uh, obviously then the priest in the Eastern Rite is the ordinary minister of confirmation, mm -hmm. unlike the Roman Rite where the bishop is the uh, ordinary minister of, of confirmation. I think that's part of our history because we, as opposed to uh, Europe, there are many, many times as many dioceses and therefore bishops mm -hmm. uh, in the history of the church. And so it was not all that difficult for the bishops to get around. And so the practice of having a bishop remain a part of the celebration of that sacrament to continue to connect the role of the bishop in initiation, which mm -hmm. is why it's there, I believe, in the Latin church, uh, wasn't experienced uh, as that necessary. However, what we do have is uh, the tradition that the chrism mm -hmm that is blessed, mm -hmm. comes from the head of your church, uh -huh. not from the local bishop, uh -huh. typically. So for instance, when I go to Romania, because I'm a member of our synod, uh, from time to time I have to go and I ask our archbishop for a quantity of the chrism that he consecrates, and not every 
Holy Thursday either, just mm. when needed. And it's generally a, a pretty uh, important occasion on a year when, when the patriarch of a church or the arch major archbishop would consecrate the chrism. And I bring that back and I explain to everybody, this is a sign of the uni union and unity of our church. It's the sign of this newly baptized person's communion with the head of our church, even though that head is in Romania. The viewers have to know, chrism is the holy oils we use within the sacraments, both of baptism, anointing of the sick, and ordination. We use a different oil for anointing of mm -hmm. the sick. In fact, there, since we're talking about the celebration mm -hmm. of the sacraments, going back to the scriptural origin of uh, the sacrament of anointing of the sick, where it says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call upon the elders, plural, of mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. The ordinary celebration of the sacrament of anointing requires the presence of seven priests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so most of the time when people are anointed, it's not the ordinary celebration. Uh -huh. But we are able, and we do, celebrate the sacrament of anointing of the sick on Holy Wednesdays, mm -hmm. when we can get seven priests together in one church and gather our communities together. Uh, seven epistle readings, seven gospel readings, seven prayers of consecration. And it's a long prayer for healing, understanding that in preparation for the celebration of the resurrection, we all need healing of one kind or another. We all need that purification that comes from anointing. Mm -hmm. Share with us, Bishop, uh, how you celebrate the rite of marriage in the Eastern Church. Marriage in, in Byzantine Church is called crowning. And in fact, one of the, uh, one of the uh, s specifics about the code of uh, canons of the Eastern Churches is that the presence of a sacred minister, the blessing of a sacred minister, is required for validity, if, you know, for those who are interested in these kinds of things. The sacrament of marriage, the crowning, uh, is called crowning because a crown is placed on the heads of the bride and groom. And it's that blessing that's considered the marriage, not the exchange of consent. And so the minister of the sacrament is the priest, not the couple themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a different em uh, emphasis. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, a deacon cannot perform a wedding, so to speak. A layperson cannot witness a wedding in that sense, uh, but must be a blessing with the crowning, the crowning being the fulfillment of the act of the couple. Mm -hmm. The exchange of consent is the betrothal ceremony mm -hmm. for us. It's the first part of the wedding ceremony. Sometimes in, in history, the betrothal has been separated from the wedding itself, mm -hmm. but it's seldom done now because, particularly in the Middle East, the betrothal is as good as a marriage. That's uh -huh. when you get the wedding, the wedding rings and uh, you are locked to one yes. another, you know, bound to one another. And, and what about the sacrament of reconciliation? <clears throat> um, It's pretty much the same that most folks are used to. We never had so much a tradition of a particular kind of booth or space in the church. Mm -hmm. Typically, one confesses one's sins before an icon mm -hmm. uh, of Christ or perhaps before the gospel book. Uh, it's, uh, it's the um, confession of one's particular sins mm -hmm. and receiving absolution from the priest. Interestingly, though, the, uh, the Byzantine Church has a tradition of lay spiritual fatherhood and motherhood. And so it's not, it has not been uncommon in our history in particular uh, that one confesses one's sins and completely exposes oneself to one's spiritual father or mother and then goes to the priest afterwards if that person isn't a priest mm -hmm. for sacramental absolution. You, you, d you mentioned earlier in our show about um, uh, the restoration of the permanent diaconate uh, being a hallmark of, of really the, the Eastern Rite Churches. Sh uh, share briefly about that with us. The, the deacon has a very significant role in uh, the Byzantine liturgy in particular. Uh, and it is the, uh, the role that crosses thresholds. The priest is expected to sort of image Moses, stay behind the screen, uh, facing God, face to face with God all the time. The deacon constantly orbits from in the altar to out among the people to lead the people's prayers, back to the altar to assist the priest, back to the people, back to the altar. And so deacons are considered the angels of the earthly liturgy, as the angels are called the deacons of the heavenly liturgy. Uh, they do they lead all the litanies, so they do all the, I guess you could call them stage directions, telling people to sit up, st stand up, or, or bow down. Um, and uh, perform a, a very uh, important function to the extent that when I first finally saw in late adolescence a Byzantine liturgy with a deacon for the first time because we didn't have one in my home parish, mm 
the liturgy finally made sense in a way it never made sense before. Even closing doors. Mm -hmm. We have doors on the icon screen that can close. It makes sense to close the doors when the deacon is out there leading the prayers and the action of the liturgy is actually in the nave and not in the altar. It's a reminder that it's the, it's the church at prayer that is the celebration of the liturgy at that time. We're coming down to the last couple minutes of our time together. Uh, I, uh, before we do that, I wanted to mention uh, one line in the, in the document, and uh, it says that uh, the diversity in the church manifests its unity. And how important that phrase is uh, when we talk about um, sister churches and, and unity within the church itself. Uh, how significant was that uh, in this document? Well, oh, that's very significant, but I'd like to throw the time uh, to the bishop to ask one final uh, question. What's the role of Mary in the Byzantine spirituality? Well, she's called the Theotokos, the bearer of God. And uh, in, in a sense, she always gets the last word mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the celebration of the Eucharist all the time. In fact, right after the prayers of consecration, she's at the head of the list of the people that the church commemorates. Mm -hmm. And so there's a long hymn to Mary as a Theotokos, higher in honor than the cherubim and more glorious beyond comparison than the seraphim, who without stain bore God the word. You, the true bearer of God, we exalt. That's that, that hymn is. And it's a very popular, very common hymn. Uh, she is the she is the yes that humanity has offered to the divine plan, and as that uh, she achieved what no human being could ever achieve, it became the pathway for our nature to be united to the divine nature. Bishop uh, Botine, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. We thank you for your presence and also uh, in this series on uh, an important anniversary of 50 years of the Vatican documents. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. The Year of Faith, celebrating 50 years of Vatican II is a production of CTNY the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jeffrey Mickler.